and I got several back. I think I had 28 actually respond to my survey, which was amazing. So I surveyed several people. I think the most interesting thing to me was that as I go to workshops for trainers, I keep hearing that everybody wants to do the get to know you, and this is a very necessary part. And yet I would say 50% of the people I talked that I surveyed said, that's just a waste of time for them, or it's very uncomfortable for them. So I think that's something I need to realize as I'm giving presentations. If I want to do that, I need to fo focus it differently so it doesn't seem like a w waste of time. So there's a purpose and it's comfortable for everybody. Yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight is making sure that learning is connected, but you, making sure your learnings, um, making sure you know your targets of what you're trying to learn, and then coming up with different ways to make that enjoyable. And it's also a twist. And when, when we talk about andragogy instead of pedagogy, andragogy being the teaching of adults. By the way, how's my voice? Is it coming through better? It's better. It yeah. Now. Okay. It's good. Strong. I turned the volume up on my – so let's see if that works. So with with andragogy or with adults, um, making the information relevant to what they want to accomplish is even more important than it is for kids. And I know that it's important for kids, but, but adults um, just tend to zone out and not really pay mm -hmm. attention, whereas kids somehow or other – Sometimes they can, you can get them to pay attention, even if, if, even if they don't understand the relevance. Yeah. So one of the questions I had, because as I was looking at it, what's fun for person A is very different than what's fun for person B or C. So how do you get something that's enjoyable, fun for everybody? That seems like a very difficult process to me. It is, and it, it, it's, it takes years. It really does. It takes years of experience. Uh, professional adults, I think. <laughs> I, taught, I taught adults for a year at State Farm, which is headquarters here in Bloomington Normal. And uh, I found it, I, I went back to teaching. I was like, kids are easier to teach than adults. Um, you know, and, and teachers are a little, there's adults and then there's teachers. <laughs> We, we are not one in the same. It, it really, we aren't. We're, we're a different entity and good and bad in some ways. But you get to, for the kids, uh, Olga mentioned Minecraft, right? So that is one across the board, fifth and sixth grade, easy for me to use because almost 99% of the kids enjoy using it. So that's, that's a way that, you know, I found, but also giving choice. And that's a whole nother avenue. And Mitch, you know, I know he's studied this, is giving that that choice and in, in activities and that pathway, that learning pathway. The only problem that you have is that you have a, you know, a, a specific amount of time that you're supposed to teach a specific content and then trying to find ways to integrate that. So you try to find simple, uh, simple games, simple interactive uh, pieces, uh, puzzles. People like puzzles, and it's it's just over time you can kind of read an audience and figure out okay they like this they like they might like this or even throwing it out there and giving them a choice. How many of you would like to do this or this or putting the putting the choice in the hands of of the participants? And I've, that's been really a huge part of of my teaching style is that you know I'm creating all these amazing things and it's just like hold on a second, the students are the ones that really should be. They sh their mind should be running through, right? My my early mentor, my first mentor said that the students should, be, you know, I do a lot of planning and everything. I'm, I'm working hard, getting everything ready. But at the end of the day, the students should be tired, more tired than me, because they're the ones that should be actively working, correct? So if you can figure out ways to have the participants create based upon what your learning targets are and turn that into something fun, and present that back to everybody else. That's that's kind of an angle that you can that you can take, and then you're going to get many different uh, learning styles and, and and methods of you know reaching the participants. And then you start banking those, putting those in the back of your head, and saying, oh, "Okay, I remember this. I'll remember this. This type of group like this. This type of group like this." And then you start building that up. But putting it in the hands of the people, I think, is I think especially adults because they want. You, 
they're if they're teachers, they're professionals, right? So you know, treat them that way. Have them give the challenges to them. And so I'm just going to weigh in also because I'll say that with with kids, um, you know, fun takes a lot of precedence, and with adults, it, it's it's important. It really is important. But another thing for adults is immediate relevance. Mm -hmm. And so when you're teaching something to understand either because you've done it before or because you've asked them, what's going to be immediately relevant about what you're going to teach them? And if you if you can make that link or if you can, through asking them, allow them to make that link, sometimes you can do it by, um, you know, by doing something that that – in, in the class that you know isn't going to work and they see that it isn't going to work and and they experience that it didn't work and you could say well how you know then how many of you have had something like this happen to you now I'm going to show you how to make this you know how to avoid this or when it happens how to make it right um, I know you know just an example that we used to use when we used to teach people how to use spreadsheets before they automatically saved is we had them work on something for about a half an hour we had them then close it and open something else. And as soon as they opened something else, I was like, you know something? I just remembered, we got to go back to that old spreadsheet and we've got to fix this. And they're like, well, how do you do that? I said, well, you didn't save it? Oh, well, let me teach you how to save something, okay? Yeah. And then they got it. Oh, now I know why you're teaching me save. If you can come up with that immediate relevance for other things that you're teaching, you'll, you know, you've got them. And it, does that help? That does. One of the things that my former boss, one of the things that she always wanted when we were doing something is that what we presented needed to be useful in the class the next day. And if it wasn't, then we had failed. And also blended personalized learning is a big thing in our, at OPS throughout the state. So we're looking at blend, personalized learning for students. And so now we're trying to make sure that we're personalizing learning also for our teachers. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. I, I and I'm going to give you a web address and this, I'm writing it down, uh, thefeast.org. And let me put it in here. And this is something that we can kind of get into uh, maybe the last week because, you know, I'm just thinking of the time that we have tonight. Um, here's the thing. This is, this has been a professional development and there's the teacher feast. There's a kid's feast. I just put it in the, the chat. Um, it's a week long PD. And basically the be beginning of the week is our mini lessons. You know, it's really, you're kind of getting into, um, um, you know, I want to learn about creating websites or using audio. I mean, Olga was talking about music, how to, how to, teach the teachers how to use audio and mix audio and video and then also so you can teach the students how to do that but the beginning of the week like the first day is these are mandatory classes the second and the tuesday wednesday and thursday it's basically teacher choice this these are the classes that are available this is what you can take and then you can start getting into it thursday and friday is that we have a five to one teacher ratio so, you know, trainer to teacher ratio. And so by the time they leave, so they could be working on things on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, they're working on projects or tools that they are going to use for that next school year. So you're right. You have to leave. You need to have something ready to go. Um, teachers want to feel like they have something ready and not wasting time because how many times have I gone to a workshop or, and I get to the end and I get all this information and th then I don't have time to implement it or even work with it. And the feast.org is one way that it, it really helps in giving the, the teachers time to work and then find people that are able to help them um, work with those tools. So we can talk about that one later, but it is, it is the finest PD that I've worked with. You're talking about, you know, 93 to 95% highly recommend or recommend uh, after the week. Uh, and it, it's just, it's been going on for 15 years. So um, just one of those things, but that's, but the fun can be, there's enjoyment. I'm, I enjoyed that I've been able to work and complete something and I've not wasted my time. And now I'm ready to go, you know, the next day or the next or the fall because of the P, this PD is in the summer. So hopefully that helps you out, Jean. And then Jenny. Hi there. Hello. Now, I think I tried to click on your link. 
for your survey, and it, it, it was, was that yours that denied yes. permission? Oh, maybe. Uh, it might have been under the WG domain, so I'd have to share it. Okay. Yeah. Don't, it's, um, it's okay. But, you summarize it, and right. you're going to summarize it now, so. Okay. Um, well, I actually, I wanted to first just share, like, one idea for Gene, because I deal with adults all the time, androgyny is, like, all we do. And, um, <laughs> and with my team of, you know, educators, um, one kind of break the ice activity that doesn't get too personal and helps to kind of focus them in on what we're going to be talking about is to give them kind of a spectrum. And you can use tape on the floor, you can use a blackboard, whatever you want to do, that kind of relates to things. Um, you can start with things that are a little more funny, like, um, you know, like, I don't know, on my team, I start with something like, you know, are you a, a morning person or a night person? Are you a this or a that? And then you start moving into the subject matter that you'll be discussing. So um, do you do really well with this type of thing or that, depending on what you're trying to um, to get at? And they can kind of align themselves. And it's sort of fun because they're up and they're moving and they're touching other people and maybe standing next to people they don't usually. And you can even harness that to say, that, okay, so we're going to be working on this. These people do really well with it. These people, not so much. Please pair up with someone on the opposite end. And then you can kind of work, roll into the workshop part of it. Um, anyway, that's adults. Well, at least the adults I've worked with really respond well to sort of like put yourself on a spectrum rather than like raise your hand and tell us all about you, you know? Um, so we're anyway. doing this all wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> When you have a group of three, there's not much of a spectrum. Okay. I mean, you know, like, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, just throwing that out there. Um, so for my team survey, um, so the, the questions that I asked was, what do you like to do in your free time? Um, what subjects did you love or hate the most in school and why? Describe your favorite teacher. What types of things did you do in that class? Mm -hmm. What do you most want to learn this year? And then what do you most want from me as your manager? Which um, that last one has been really informative for me because I got lots of answers that I have weekly one-on-ones and they never brought it up. So it's amazing mm. what a survey will do <laughs> when they're not talking right with you, I guess. Um, but, uh, but there are a lot of themes in terms of the things that they want to learn how to do. Um, many of them it was some efficiency strategies. Some of them it was, um, you know, mentoring particular situations. Uh, so it gave me some great ideas about how I can do some team training. Cool. And, uh, yeah. And in terms of fun, um, I'm going to start doing my weekly meetings, starting them with a, a weekly poll that might be serious or might just be funny. Um, and, uh, and I asked them all to, um, they, we do user manuals on my team. So the other thing I wondered about with Jean is if the people she's working with, is this like a one afternoon thing or if it's something that she's doing for a couple of days with them, that sometimes having them create a user manual is really helpful because they can share it with their colleagues and it can have a few simple questions like, how do I like to get feedback? How do I not like to get feedback? Do I like emojis or not? You know, like it can be simple things, but just stuff that helps to avoid some easy miscommunications on a team Great or uh, among a group of colleagues. Yep. And I, I um, like you, you, the fun, you know, having simple games or uh, having a poll. Um, what's funny, it, funny, we're talking about fun, um, is that most of my students don't know the cartoon, The Far Side, the comic, oh, yeah. The Far Side. And so, I've opened their eyes to the intelligence of the far side and they just starting out the class. And I remember a professor in college, we'd get, I enjoyed them, but most kids, Oh, great. Another far side cartoon or comic. And, and it was just like, but now these kids, they don't know what they are. They're like, this is awesome. And I go, yeah, it is. So, <laughs> you know, just getting, just lighten up the moment. Yeah. Uh, I think is, is, is nice. Just having, feeling that comfort. You were going to say something else. Oh, just uh, so I'm using this in the team. My team has grown a lot. I've got five new people starting right now. And so I asked them all to, to look to, I paired them up with people they don't usually talk to very much because of schedules. And they, they need to read the other person's user manual and then have like a little mini three minute interview where they ask a question that they have after reading their user manual. And then in our team meeting, they'll kind of report out on that. So that way, you're not telling about yourself. You're telling about somebody else. And sometimes that's a lot more comfortable, um, especially for introverts. So when you say user manual, you're not talking about a user manual about how to use something else. You're saying a user manual, like, how do you interact with me? For you. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Like, that's how, cool. how do you work with me at work, right? So, and I did this, I did this as a manager. Um, 
where I had all kinds of things. So I had some unfiltered information about me. Like I'm often late to meetings, right? <laughs> things like that you've noticed. Um, and, uh, and also things like how to get an extra gold star with me. Like what are the things that capture my attention? What are the things that drive me crazy? Um, and, and also how, you know, like if you really need me to do something, how should you communicate with me about that? Um, mm -hmm. Like, so it doesn't fall to the cracks basically. So just giving them some ideas that they can figure something out right away without having to like take a few months to figure out like, Oh, this is how Jenny works and this is how I can work with her. I like um, that better. I like that better than, because I would always, and I'm guessing most of you know what IEPs are, individual education plans. I honestly, honestly believe everyone needs an IEP. It, it, it shouldn't be one of those things that, oh, you have an IEP. Well, you, you're not that intelligent or whatever. You struggle in these areas. No, I, I think we all have those areas. But I like the user manual. I, I like that. Yeah, I, I like the idea of having a series, like a, um, a guide at the beginning of school to give to your students the first day of class yeah. with like, you know, 10 or 12 questions, answer these questions to create a user manual for you. How yeah. do you want, you know, how do you want people to interact with you? And then the second day is maybe, okay, now discuss your user manual and somebody else's user ma manual with another student and then have that student, have that other person, your partner, talk about how people should interact with you. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah, that can be really yeah. helpful. It saved a lot of like tension on my team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. And then I, I'm trying to think of other fun things to do. That's, I have a team meeting every week, so I'm, I'm still brainstorming. I love the idea of putting up a cartoon or a comic. Um, so I'll, I'll have to find something uh, for that. But uh, I have a collection yeah. of four short little videos from YouTube, um, that I pull up just just things that, you know, the new one that I have, because being in Bloomington Normal, the State Farm commercial uh, with the dog and the veteran and the homeless kid about helping neighbors. I don't know if you've seen that uh, commercial. The guy's on a subway and, and he sees a picture of a dog, uh, lost dog or, you know, help a pet. It's It's got a popular song on there. My girls sing the song every time they see the commercial. But, you know, it, that's kind of a sad, you know, that's a, kind of a sad one, but it, it you, emotion is part of that, you know, that you want to help mm -hmm. and you want to do some good things. So, you know, it's, it's just capturing, capturing those moments. Yeah. And setting the mood. Sometimes a little, a little somber. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And so, yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, so maybe uh, we should move on to, we covered kind of learning objectives for this session and uh, actually, oh, so the next time we did, <laughs> Yeah, I got. Hey, I got it up here because you know I have multiple screens here. So, learning authentic and personal, and uh, others learn from and with others, and that's the next thing. So, share your video list. Uh oh. Well, first of all, uh, share your video list. Uh, Z a c h is Zach, and my name is Zach. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry. That's it's that my goes into your user manual, right? That is in my user manual. Manual. Right. I'm not a Zachary. I'm just, I'm Zach. My dad, it's a whole story. It's just, it's, that's, yeah, embedded in me. It has nothing to do <laughs> with you, Jenny, or anybody. So, yeah, there's one of those things. So, okay. Zach will, <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, your IE. Okay, very good. Um, next one here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Always learning, improving. Okay, so th <laughs> this was a debate that Mitch and I were having. Um, so for me, learning as an educator, if you're not learning, and that, especially for, I think most of you that are in PD, um, you don't have a job if, if teachers aren't, you know, learning and continue to learn. But if you stop learning, you should get out of the profession. That's the way I look at it. But learning today is like the Titanic. And this is, <laughs> Mitch and I were having a debate because this could be, looked at in many different ways. One of the ways that, um, well, you, Mitch, you had this, okay, so there were many crimes of the Titanic. Right. Right? So, so yeah, because because I, when I saw this slide, um, it was like, well, I think everybody agrees that the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic was not a good thing. You know, it's not like people are saying, oh, the Titanic was good because, you know, 10% uh, of the people got out and it's and it's really most people are saying hey it's not like the education system is good so let's right. you know, so let's, let's take a look at what the, 
when we were talking about this, yeah, learning, but I was also thinking the education system because there's a small percentage that can, that is succeeding, right? Uh, that right. is, no matter what the situ whatever situation you put them in, they're going to uh, be okay. Uh, but that percentage has been dropping ever since I started teaching back in 1995. It's, you, you teach the same way and you, it, you're doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and you're expecting the same results. You're get, and it's not happening. It's actually getting worse. But you, let's let's go to the the crimes that we talked about. So so, so the first crime was that, that the Titanic was correctly. Nobody nobody understood. You know nobody thought about the fact that having all these the bottom of the Titanic that as soon as the water started spill out spilling out of one bin and the ship would probably sink. So that was the the you know, the first crime. The second crime was that whoever was watching this gigantic iceberg <laughs> yeah. right in front of the ship. So, you, you know, they cut the ship, turn the ship, warn people, you know, others have done, but, but, but they didn't do. And, crime. and back on the, um, cause you're kind of breaking a little bit, but they, oh, seeing the iceberg. Yeah. We see the problems in education and we want to make changes, but we're such a large ship that we have trouble turning. <laughs> we, we don't, we right. don't turn very quick. By the time we make the changes, um, something new happens, right? Something new, uh, the new, the next new way of learning comes about. Right. So yes. Right. And we, we, we've had, we have many icebergs in education. Okay. So people weren't watching out for disasters on the iceberg. They just were merely going along and they, they hit the, the iceberg. Next was that they, um, they didn't have enough um, uh, rescue boats. On, you know, they only had enough rescue boats for something like 15% of the people because they never even dawned that there would be a problem. So, so they didn't have like a plan B that would incorporate everybody. And then given that they didn't have enough people, they, ba they basically um, des designed the escape based on class. So if you had the, if you were wealthy enough to be able to afford first class, like if you're wealthy enough to be able to afford your own first class education for your kids, you're okay. Okay. It was just all the rest of us. Um, who were on the lower berths, who basically perished because we weren't allowed, we weren't even allowed to get into the iceberg. So, so, so okay. the, so the, I, okay. So not having enough lifeboats, I can kind of connect to uh, losing um, gifted education, losing special ed teachers, because that's been, that's been shrinking. I don't know about the rest of you, but um, you know, special ed is just kind of going by the wayside. We have students that need assistance, but we don't, we don't have enough people to help out. Actually, in, in the state of Illinois, surprise, surprise, because our state's doing so well, we're short teachers. So uh, so we don't have enough lifeboats. And then you get into the idea that um, the upper class will have the lifeboats. Well, that's kind of like what we see in education today. If you have a strong family, if you're wealthy, if you have better chance to survive through the education system, uh, because you might be on, you might be on a better boat. <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. I mean, you're, you're, you're not even on. So, or it's leveled like you're in the, you know, the upper class uh, levels of, of the Titanic and all the way down to the, to the, what is that called? Steerage, you know, right. you're in, and that's kind of the way our schools have been uh, going and that's how they're set up. Um, it, it, things aren't equal. And so, that's kind of the. Was there another crime, or I mean, we have that's enough crimes. I think I'm thinking. Yeah, so I think I can't remember if it was three or four, but those were the four yeah. that came to mind. So, but the last one there is that if you're wealthy enough, you're going to survive through a lot of this, and so. But another part is that you, the way that we teach, the way that has been, you know, with the Carnegie system, especially in high school, the point system, and you're sitting in rows and in the sage on the stage, the people up front, so on and so forth. Um, that's been a method that's been around for a very long time. And there are still places that teach that way. And we, we can't teach that way. We need to teach in different ways. And that's where this learning idea came to me is that you need to have ways that the kids can connect to that learning. 
They need to have some type of connection, whether it's through something that's fun, whether it's something that's personal or emotional, whatever it might be, that learning, we as a teacher know what our learning targets are. It's our job as professionals to make sure that um, we help the students make connections to that learning. And, and to give you an example, um, we were I'm teaching Greece and Rome. And just to give you an idea of an essential question that we came up with, you know, that the kids started brainstorming ideas. And the, the question was, if the Greeks were so smart, why did they um, why did they have slavery and why were women not considered equal? Now, if you really start, and this is sixth grade students, this is what we came up with, which I'm just thoroughly impressed. But you can you can make a connection to that because I have a diverse classroom, so you know slavery is going to make sense. Uh, you know, talking about uh, equal rights and and women being treated fairly, and even in Greece, you talk about Sparta and Athens. I mean, there's there's a difference there. But even through our discussions, we found out that yeah, Spartan women were treated better. But it's still they weren't equal. <laughs> so, you know, how now they can make connections. OK, have we really made um, have we really made gains since, you know, 300 B.C. to today? So it, making questions and having ways to connect the students, um, it takes a lot of work, but you, you really need to find ways to to make those connections meaningful. So. So we're on this one. Okay, so learning needs to be fun and engaging. Does it need to be fun and engaging all the time? Well, no. It, it, it's oh, it's almost impossible. You can't be. I am. I'm not going to be a first grade teacher. My wife teaches first grade. She has to be on all the time, right? I mean, you're constantly, mo you know, doing lessons. But there's times that you have to do. So you have to do some work. You have to do a little bit of work. What we've been working on is is gaining knowledge. And turning that knowledge into, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, digital breakout boxes, uh, escape rooms type type of situation. So the the activity that they were doing might not have been super exciting, but the end goal, what they were working towards, was going to be fun for them. That's kind of a new method that I've that I've been doing is that you you're giving them a picture of the puzzle or they're creating the puzzle, whatever it might be, they, they know what the end goal is and they're working to strive for that. So they're willing to put in a little bit harder work up to that point so they could get to that end goal. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just like playing in a, in a sport where I practice really hard knowing that, you know, it'll pay off because if I do really well, that's, there's some intrinsic motivation there. So, um, you know, using uh, I've used a lot from the surveys that I've that I've had in the class, and I I've learned a ton. I've changed a lot of my lessons around based upon what the students have been sharing with me, as long as it fits and it's appropriate, not not anything silly. But that is, as you all know, especially doing PD, is that that those surveys play an important role um, in where they're going. And so sometimes the simple changes can have a big impact. Like I was mentioning with the the comic strips. Uh, those just little moments like that, breaking it up, not having, especially if I go 15 minutes, um, you know, I try to change activities up every 15 minutes in the classroom uh, to keep things going. And I'll even ask because it's depending on, because they've been working out on these breakout boxes and I, I'll set a timer, 15 minutes goes off and I go, okay, are we good? You know, can we sit And They're like, when they start yelling, no, 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 we want to keep working then you know you've got them okay they can have sustained they can have sustained work but a, a really good book that talks about simple changes is mike uh mike matero's explorer like a pirate and he uses dice and cards and risk you know taking chances and risk um throughout the, his class periods and sometimes it's it's one of those things that okay we're gonna do this choice or this choice hey do you want to roll the dice it, it just just something silly, you know, something, you know, to, to try. Well, if it's an even number, we're going to do this activity. If it's an odd number, we're going to do this activity just to change things up a little bit. Um, those are always, those are always fun. Okay. I feel I, I'm at a moment here that uh, I've talked too long. So does anybody have any, you want to raise your hand? Do you have any comments to ask questions about what we talked about? Uh, if you want to know the history of the Titanic, 
you know, I, I've, mm-hmm. I've read a lot about <laughs> I read a lot about it. Um, you know, those poor people in steerage. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so any, anybody raise their hands? Or they so just, what are uh, some of the things that, that you can get from Explore Like a Pirate? You know, because I, I know he talks about gamification and game-based yeah. tools. So he likes doing uh, uh, point tallies. So you're mm-hmm. doing an activity. You gain experience points from that. The more points you have, the more that he'll come up with a game that, um, you know, you get more chances uh, at, a, a, at a game. So maybe it's like... Um, um, what is it? Not Jeopardy, like a Jeopardy board where it's, you know, here are boxes and you turn around the box and there's, um, you can win, you know, 500 experience points or you win a piece of candy or, you know, or you have to wash all the tables or, you mm-hmm. know, he, he has all these different things that, you know, just kind of crazy stuff out there ideas, or you get an extra bathroom pass or, you know, um, it just, you know, you don't have to turn your homework assignment in at, you know, you can skip a homework assignment. You know, I'm not big on homework, but that's, you know, just giving you an idea that there's a lot of different, and I'm sitting here thinking, where's that? Of course, when I'm wanting to find the book, uh, of course I can't find it. So did I let somebody borrow that game or that book? So Mm -hmm. it's one of those things that it's just, uh, just kind of a, sometimes it's just silly ideas um, that he's able to implement in rolling, you know, like I said, rolling dice and so on and so forth. I've used some, I've been using something called Classcraft, which is, um, uh, it's kind of a upgraded version of, of Class Dojo. And I don't know if any of you have ever seen that. So it's, it's like if the kids are doing good things, they earn experience points, and then they can change their avatar and add clothing and change, you know, different parts of it. Just little, little fun things with that. And I mean, you, you you mentioned Kahoot. Do you use when you use Kahoot? Do you come up with your own questions, or do you use questions that that other you know that are in some library? I'm having my squirrel moment here, Mitch. Okay. I'm sitting here like I know I have the book somewhere. Um, so Kahoot, what I really enjoy doing, I most of the time I just look for Kahoots that uh, match up with what I'm doing and I'll edit them and change them up. What's really been fun as I was kind of mentioning before, I've thrown it at the, been giving it to the students where the students have been creating their own cahoots, sharing those with me. And then I'll say, Hey, I'm, this is Johnny's cahoot. He did a great job on this. Uh, you know, and they feel, pr- he feels pretty good about that. So now just that little intrinsic uh, idea. And then, then I create, like um, I have my list of, of websites and a symbol and so I'll put Johnny's Kahoot up there and then, you know, that's shared out with everybody. And that's really nice. But they've used Kahoot as like a review. And I've had kids where they've created their own review games and then they'll go, hey, can we review, you know, uh, for this for this unit? And they'll go off into the corner of the room and they'll set up one of the computers and then kids are sitting around and they're playing the Kahoot. That's done on their own. I I didn't even have to, that's not a forced thing. It's just like, that's something that they've done because it's just the environment that I have in my classroom is that, you know, I I want them to create and I give them the freedom to do that. And I give them the freedom to share. So it's just a great little platform and very friendly to teachers too. They're good people. Okay. Okay. And continuing along with the student viewpoint. Yeah. So um, I can't pronounce this guy's name. What? What? So learning can't be too hard or too easy. Easy. So I think some of you have played probably um, uh, Candy Crush, and there's a point in time when you get so far and you can't go any farther, and it just you get stuck. If it's too hard, you quit, right? Mm-hmm. So you got there's a certain time in there when you're flowing just just right, where everything's moving along. You're challenged enough, you know, that you keep going. It's not too hard, not too easy. You know, the three bears. And, um, yeah, I can't pronounce his name. Mihaly. Yeah, you, you sent me a video on even how to pronounce his right. name. I don't, and and yeah. I can't pronounce it either. But I'm going to say um, uh, Chexamania. <laughs> I can, yeah, something like that. Right. So he's done a study on flow. And there's, there's science behind that. There's, there's science behind addiction. Um, and some people use it in a um, 
in a very profound way, Facebook has a lot of this in it. And it's not that it's too hard or too easy. It's just the idea that um, you are kind of conditioning yourselves to, to check, you know, your status and, and things like that. But well, it's all good games do that. All, all games do that. And you want to, you want to stay on top of those. Um, but that's how they make money. And Jim G goes into this a lot where he talks about how, you know, uh, somebody that's creating a game, they're trying to make money on this game. And if it's too hard, people are not going to play it. And then you don't make money. If it's too easy, people aren't going to play it. You're not going to make money. So you have to have it just right. And that's one thing that games can do that, especially what we should try to mimic in the classroom is that there's, um, you can change the difficulty of a lot of games. You know, you can say, you know, I'm a just, I'm a beginner all the way up to that, you know, I'm um, a master or, you know, whatever it might be. And you can change the level of the game to match your, your level. And just kind of like what we do in the classroom with differentiation. We want to challenge, and that's the difficult part is that, and is this where, uh, is this something else later, Mitch, where you talk about how um, you try to teach to normal or teach to well, average? Yes, I don't remember when, when we brought that up, but just there's, well, I'm going to go back a second okay. and just yes. still talk about flow. And, yeah. you know, it's not, a, it's not a new concept either because it's a better term. The original term was in, you know, in, when, <coughs> when we all took education classes, which came from Vygotsky, which was the zone of proximal development. But it's the same idea. If you're doing something or if you're having to do, do something that they already know how to do, they're going to be bored. Mm -hmm. Doing something that they don't even think they can do, they're going to get frustrated. But the zone where they're most assist and learn is somewhere between there. It's right, right past their comfort zone, but it's not where they're feeling completely uncomfortable. And he called it the zone of proximal development. When you're in the when you're teaching in the zone of proximal development, people are going through flow, which is which is basically addicting. Right, and and. What, and, and and you want to try to give, so giving different activities. So I might do a mini lesson in the beginning of class, and then I give them a challenge. It's just like, okay, I want you to, I want you to complete this task, or I want you to answer this question. And, and, you know, it could be, um, we, I've taught the kids how to use Google sites. So we started off, I was telling them how, you know, this is how you set everything up, you know, you do everything. And then I put a, a Google site up there and, um, I want the kids to mimic that. I want them to create that on their own. Well, if I just put a basic site, the kids that are that are understand how to create a website, they're going to get through it really quickly and then be done with it. And then they're going off and doing other things. If I put something up there that is super challenging and start putting HTML code in there and they're like, what in the world? I mean, they're going to quit because they don't even know how to do that. So the difficult part is, is you know, I've done this also where I've done some where it's like, okay, if you're just starting out, let's try this one. Let's mimic this site. If you want a little bit more of a challenge, go to this, try to create this page, you know, try to mimic this page. And that's, you, you want those kids to be able to, um, to have somewhat of a challenge and you don't want to scare them away. So, so I think we've, and the we've way you're, you're talking, you're, the way you're talking about it, though, or not, not even though, the way you're talking about it is the way you actually teach it. But the right. way you design it is actually the opposite of that. The way is you think, where do I want them to end? Okay, so that's the end goal. But right. the end goal is probably beyond what they're comfortable doing. So right. as you're thinking about how you're progressing from where they are, are to where they're going to be, you start gasping. Start with well. What do I? What supports do I need to give them so that they right. can get close to this and feel comfortable? And then right. what? Which of those supports can I move away to make it more challenging? And then which supports do I move away? So the way to think about um, keeping people in the flow is you know starting off or well, where are they now? Where do I want them to end up? And then what are some some scaffolding and unscaffolding steps that I can go through so that they're always in that flow 
state or or the material is in the zone of proximal development. Okay, so now I'm seeing because I had my instant message thing behind my conversation with admin. Uh, okay, so I, I'm going back here. So and, and I can't Jenny, see that. So people yeah, could know, be talking so, about me, and I don't even know. Yeah, Jenny, you don't need to apologize. It, it's all. <laughs> I'm going back. It's all good. It's just one of those things. It's my dad's fault. It, yeah. So uh, let's see, and then let's make a deal. Yeah, that's or Price is Right, Plinko Board, totally. And then Jenny also, uh, Chick sent me high. Remember that, Mitch? That's how yes. you pronounce oh, his name. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Saw the information about the guy and flow and learn X course on deep learning. Yes, definitely. He, has, he does have a good TED talk. You you are correct. Uh, does this mean the Does this mean that a modular approach to lesson is easiest to personalize in terms of challenge? Okay. Now I need to break this down. Does this mean that a modular approach to lessons is easier to personalize in terms of challenge? What do you mean by modular? Like sectioned units? Is Jenny's? Well, we so, um, do you want to so, come up, Jenny, real quick? Yeah, Jenny, would you mind coming up? <laughs> you just. You, just do you mind coming out? Click you. You threw right. up there. <laughs> yeah, as as you, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I guess you could think of it as units um, or even a, in terms of like when you're preparing, if you wanted to get the different learning objective, for example, that you could make units that take students from different levels of where they're starting. So, yeah. you know, based on how where a student is starting, you would start here to get to that point when another right. student may be here and get to that point. Um, is that an important thing to be thinking about with lessons? And, um, and have you done that? How oh, yeah. is it? Just wondering. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, that's so, and then constantly giving formative, uh, that, you know, that's formative assessment, seeing where they're at, giving feedback. And that's where games, just the, and don't worry about, don't think about games as in, you know, video games and things like this, but the, the idea and how they're set up is that it's constantly assessing you and how you're doing within that game. And games can adjust based upon your gameplay to make it more difficult or easier for you. And they can give you different pathways. You have choices. You can make choices. That's where, um, you know, this whole idea that uh, if you're a language arts teacher, a kid comes up to me and says, okay, um, I don't know what to read. Okay, what do you like? You know, so you start questioning the, the kid and figuring out, uh, what they like. So that's kind of like a formative. I'm, I'm gathering data. And then I give them a book and um, it, it's too hard. Okay. Well, let's give you some, did you like the content? Well, didn't. Okay. So he likes sci-fi, whatever it might be. Okay. Try this book. You tried that out. And then you see that the style of that author, and then you start making adjustments and figuring out a plane, a path for that student to go. Well, if you like this author, you might like this type of book and you might like this type of book and you try to get it as you're moving along, you're trying to make it more difficult because you're trying to increase the ability of that child to read. And so they're constantly practicing that reading as they're moving along. So when you're doing these modular, you know, get smaller units, you're trying to figure out, okay, is this kid, are they okay? Are we ready to move along? And that's the difficult part because we're teaching to kind of a, what teachers feel is a center, like an average. And when Just I need to life. see... Yeah, it's the next slide. So what I've done, though, and what's helped me out is that I've given a lot of open-ended assignments to where, you know, there's a, it, it's an open-ended question. Okay, this is what we need to do that uh, we need to build. Well, in Minecraft, you know, let's build a uh, ancient Egyptian village. Well, after I start seeing what the kid's able to do, then I start adjusting what I ex my expectations for them are. Are they good at building? Or are they better at research? What what are their different skill areas? So I try to I try to guide them along as almost like a coach, helping them saying, okay, this is where you're at. Okay, now with the end in mind that I want them to understand how humans interact with the environment, which is a target, correct? So I'm trying to figure out ways for them to do that, whether that's building or doing research or even even project management maybe i have i had one kid that was really good might might not have been able to do the individual skills but they were able to go around and start mapping things out well 
these these students need to work on this part and these students need to work on this part and i go well why what are so i start asking them questions it's very it's very difficult this brain our brains are able to do this right they're able to instantly figure out johnny is doing this activity how can i stretch him to the next level and and move that along that takes years of experience right it takes years of of practice but that's kind of where that's kind of where we're heading to and i'm hoping that technology can kind of help us along a little bit to give us a little bit more data so i can i can do that but um it's really figuring out what the student's able to do and then it's also finding out that especially in a minecraft project you know this kid really likes to build and they're having a blast with it. But I also got to make sure that they're understanding and, and reaching those targets that we've set up. And that's sometimes, you know, you got to move them along and make sure that they're that they're doing that. So, yes, breaking it up into smaller chunks is, is very important before they move on to the next step. Uh, but they always have the, they always have the picture of the puzzle. They always have. So my, my I mentioned this before. My first mentor talked about um, you want to give them the picture of the puzzle right before they start and then they can because if if you if you give them the puzzle pieces and they don't have the picture it's almost impossible to create the i mean it, it takes a long time to do that and it gets very frustrating so you give them the picture this is these are our goals this is where we're getting to and you're constantly reminding them along the way but on a project like minecraft i've got i've got 25 kids i got 20 different five different <laughs> pathways to get to that end goal that's it, it's tough it's really difficult to do and I want to just cover just a something with methodology because going going back to this slide about flow, you know, there's a difference between the gamer's uh, vocabulary and the educator's yeah. vocabulary, yeah. even though the terms mean virtually the same thing. So educators talk about the zone of proximal development, okay, but get, but in game design, you talk about flow and mm -hmm. fiero, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I, that you know, uh, Jane McGonigal, I think, is the one who used the term Fiero, but it's that moment where you say, Yeah, she owned, you know, like she I got it. one in the okay. yeah, she owned one in okay. the 80s. So, um, so but it's but the, they're 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 kind of related, okay? Um, you know, uh, flow happens when you're in the zone of 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 um proximal development. Educators talk about scaffolding and removing the scaffolds, well. You know, games gamers talk about levels, level up. So, so you know, just changing your vocabulary can just make what you're doing more exciting to the students. Because when you're talking about, okay, now it's time to level up. Well, that sounds a lot. That's a lot more exciting to the students than saying, well, you know, okay, now I'm going to make this a little bit more difficult. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe adopt a little bit of of the gamers' uh, vocabulary as we yeah. talk about what we're doing in the classroom. And so, and I don't mean to scare anybody by, you know, what I just explained, because as I'm sitting here going, yeah, that, that could kind of um, be a little bit intimidating, I guess, especially in a professional development uh, model is that, you know, having a mini lesson, um, giving some choice, having an end product in mind and have the participants create that. And then you can guide them along. I think that's an easy, easier way to look at it. Um, does that does that make sense? You know, you're, you, they're they're making a choice for an for your end goal, your end target uh, of how they get there, and then you just kind of guide them along. Um, I think that's that's kind of what I've I've done with Minecraft and many of the different projects. So these breakout boxes the kids are creating. It's on them. They they know that they need to reach. They need to teach uh, or demonstrate certain learning targets, and in these breakout boxes. But how they do that, that's totally up to them. And each group that's put this together, I mean, it, they've been. <laughs> I'm blown away with the the creativity, and they're having a blast with that. If I gave them a template and said, "Follow this template," which I don't know how many times I've seen teachers give templates for like a PowerPoint presentation or some type of Google Slides, and you had to follow it exactly that way, <laughs> um, or you know, you're going to get points off. And I'm like, give them some creativity, give them some flexibility. Their, their purpose of putting a presentation together is to get the message out, right? 
so please don't judge our presentations here. <laughs> so, so you, you okay. brought up average student. That's really the fourth. Yeah, point here, I've been but coming back to that. The first three. So okay, so the 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 learning targets. This is where it gets kind of frustrating. And I've gone from one district, and I know there's districts out there that are far more stringent on this, uh, where you have to be in this nine weeks. You have to teach these targets. And you have to give these assessments where there's no choice at all. There's districts like that to where, you know, okay, these are the learning goals for these targets. I teach social studies. I have, I have my standards, uh, C3 standards. Um, now, how I teach those and how I assess those is totally up to me. But there are districts that uh, force that upon the teachers. And that's, that, that to me is kind of scary because that's, that's taking the fun out of what I do as an educator as a professional creating and how in the world can you create a common and we have these common assessments uh, in my old district. How can, I don't even know how you can have a common assessment because it's, it's each class is different. Each kid is different. I might come up with uh, different types of assessments to re reach certain kids in my classroom. I don't get that flexibility and some, some teachers don't have that. Um, and that's that's kind of scary. So your, your learning targets are based um, as a teacher or district mandate, mandated. Uh, is that based on whole class or individually, right? And so that's that's what's scary too. Is that sometimes a lot of teachers teach for the whole class and not that individual students. And then the real question is, what is best for the learner? When you look at all of this, the I think we've I think we've in agreement because from what I've heard from all of you. What's best for the learner is that that's done individually. Um, that is, like I said, is very difficult to do. Uh, there's no way that I can, I haven't gotten to the point in my career or professionally that I could assess different targets at different times in the same classroom. Um, but I, I do come up with different ways to assess my students. Um, you know, Olga, you were talking about how, uh, you know, using music and dance. So, you know, I've built up a tool belt over my years that, okay, I need the students to uh, demonstrate their knowledge on this target. Um, here are different ways you can do it. You can use Minecraft. You can create a song or a rap or whatever video, whatever it might be, stop motion animation, whatever, whatever tool that you want to use. I'll come up with different, uh, allow the students to choose different methods to, to show me. Um, but that's done individually. And I think that's where, it's personalized for the student. They can make a connection to it. Um, and that's when I get the best results. Okay. So, and then the last, last one there, myth of the average student. Right. Well, the, the, that's there because, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about the average student and the uh, proficiency, but it was, it was interesting. If you look through this, the, this article, I think it was in this article that they talked about the study that they did of, of um, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 students to figure out, you know, which ones were average. And they looked out over the different learning standards and they found that um, that something something like three percentage of the students were average across the different criteria. There's no such thing as an average student. A student may be, at, you know, in the at the mean point or at the median point for one particular learning objective, but for the next one, they're going to be below average. And for the next one, they're going to be above average. And so <clears throat> we have to look at people, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, as, as individuals, it's kind of interesting that as a country, we say we're all about individualism. And yet what do we do? Oh, mm -hmm. you're above average. <laughs> you know, you're, 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 we're comparing people to a group. So as teachers, it's just something we have to get get around is thinking about, oh, this this is an average student. No, it's not an average student. This is a student who's above average in some things and below average in other things, but it's a student who's an individual. And that's why I like the standard grade, standard based grade book that I use. Right. Um, and so, I mean, it's each grade is based upon each standard, each each target. I had a student, we had, I just gave an assessment today over two targets. One was on creating a, uh, supporting questions for essential questions. The other one was on demonstrating uh, democratic values within the school or community. And I had one student um, got a four. I mean, so three means I get it. I understand it. There's no question about it. Two means I have a little, some questions, you know, I'm almost there. 
a four is I get it, but not only do I get it, I understand it at a different level and I can, I can basically teach it to others. Um, and so I had one student that got a four on the first target and got a one on the next target, you know, so why would I average those two scores? I mean, that makes, that makes no sense. It's, it's, and, and, and school districts are doing that, which just, just blows my mind. So when you, when you, separate those and my our students the school has been using this model for what five years now the kids understand that and they're not they're not concerned about you know what's what's my average grade on this those you know i got a four and a one so you're going to average that they're not worried about that they know they got a he got a four on the the first target he got a one on the other and then he can start focusing on okay what do i need to improve and and do better on this target um that's also uh, taking ownership and that, that makes it easier for the students to understand. It makes it easier for the parents to understand, but um, there's a connection there. So, and that connection to learning, that's so exactly what I'm, exactly what I was just mentioning there. They understand their learning. If you give a student an A, what does that mean? I always, I always, always tell ask parents, so what does it mean when your student has an A? Well, it means they're good in social studies. In what? Geography, civics, economics? What? In what areas? Well, they couldn't tell me. So now that we've gone to standards based, it's they they know where their strengths are and um, and their um, weaknesses. So, uh, as I mentioned before, learning has to have meaning. So it's creating ways to give it meaning uh, to make connections. How about how about this one? Uh, we were talking about geography uh, in my fifth grade class. I gave him I gave him this idea and this is <laughs> really, really deep but it got the kids to think. I said, the settlement of our colonies in the beginning of, of, you know, of America, of, of Europeans coming to America. I said, the settlement of these colonies is the reason why we have, why we had slavery, is the reason why we had, uh, that we have racism, is the reason why uh, we have difficulties uh, between groups of people in, in North and South today. And it's all because of geography. Well, geography is what laid out in the South certain types of crops being grown, certain methods of picking and get, gathering those crops. And so slavery became, you know, an important part of that. In the North, different crops were grown. Different types of people were brought there uh, based on religious uh, backgrounds. And so just going through this discussion, so having the students talk about, okay, these people moved here and these people move here, that's great. But giving them context of, <laughs> we have, there was a civil war and it was, you could basically trace it back to where people settled when people came over here. Uh, in the beginning, they made, they finally, they made a connection to that. So, and that gets into the emotion part there's some type of emotion that's there in making those connections. So that's, that's another method that you can use. So yes, Mitch, I can see that. So <laughs> if you're, um, okay. So science shows making lessons uh, relevant really matters. Edutopia is a great website. And then MindShift um, benefits of gaming, what research shows. So, you know, making lessons, uh, I know there's the idea out there, the um, the project-based learning that Edutopia does, um, making real life connections. My daughter, uh, my oldest daughter, is going to be. Um, we already know. I mean, this is this is the path that she's wanted to go. She wanted to uh, to save money is to go to community college for two years and then go off to you know a university. And because she made those choices, she, because she made that choice early on, she actually had more choices in what classes she took in high school. What I find interesting is that kids that are going to, you know, a community college have more choices in high school. Kids that are wanting to go off to a, you know, a Harvard or the University of Illinois where I'm, you know, at Northwestern, Big Ten School, anything like that, they really have no choice in the courses they take. They're forced into these courses. Well, because my daughter's been able to make choices in taking art or culinary, um, you know, uh, culinary classes or uh, child care. And then she's actually going to be uh, taking classes at a vocational center for to be get a CN. I think that's what it is. It's a, uh, um, I don't know if it CN is the right term, but um, to, she wants to become a nurse. So she was given those uh, choices and she's really excelled, but I don't think she would have excelled in taking all those 
mandatory classes that she would have to take uh, if she wanted to go off to like the University of Illinois uh, or Northwestern. So making it relevant, she saw that it was relevant. She saw that she had a chance to, to take classes, to try different, um, to, you know, basically experiment um, to figure out what she wanted to do. So making those relevant, and I, I think we take a lot of those choices away from the kids. So uh, benefits of gaming, a um, little disingenuous to say that gamers, games are good for kids. Games are not like vegetables. Don't imagine as if they're packed with vitamins and nutrients, they help kids grow in healthy adults. Like all forms of media, it depends on the particular games and how they are used. Um, there are some games out there that are totally inappropriate. Um, and you know, it just depends on how you use that. Honestly, there's any, I could probably take any game out there and find a way to use it, uh, to teach. It, it, it's, it's all there, whether it's, uh, poker to world of Warcraft to, you know, um, Uno, I mean, you can find ways to use games, but it depends on how you use it. Right. Um, okay. So our time is flying here, Mitch. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Gene said with the four by four mandate dated in Texas and now in some extent, Oklahoma, unfortunately there's no time for the, I know. And that's what's, that's, what's really frustrating. Gene is that, um, it, huh, that's, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate to say it this way. That's the Titanic. It, it there, there's the iceberg and they're not concerned about making uh, course changes. Uh, in fact, they're full steam ahead. Um, and that's, that's, what's very frustrating. You're on a very big ship and it's not wanting to turn when all the research and everything's telling us that, um, y you need to give more flexibility and you need to give, um, teachers and students the opportunities to, to experiment and explore and individualize. Yeah, it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, student view But to a certain extent, at least you can close your door. Porch, right oh, you kind of broke up there you can close the door yeah oh, but then yeah the problem is the problem is that uh, you know you as a teacher are being um, um, your evaluation is based upon you know right. following those directives that's what's uh that's what's so frustrating so it's 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 what makes it more difficult and what's interesting gene is coming up with creative ways so i know that for many years and that's how minecraft one of the first ways i found about, out about minecraft was that it's mandated in texas that you uh draw make a 3d model of the alamo and um they finally figured out hey we could use um we could use minecraft to do that and a lot of teachers at the beginning were saying no that's that's and then once some videos came out and teachers saw this they're like whoa, that's really cool on how you can use Minecraft to do that. So it's it's coming up with those creative ways and it takes time to build those in, but it also takes professional development to, to help the teachers uh, utilize those tools and making sure that they want to use. I mean, that's the other thing that we talked about too, with the fun that they have to, um, teachers have to be authentic about using those tools. If you hate Minecraft, don't use it. You can't close the door when you have to stay in the, yeah, I know, yeah. Um, yep. Yep. I understand completely. It's it. That's the thing. It just takes time to, um, come up with creative methods. But the only problem is that we're given less time to do and, and we do more. That's the frustrating. That's what we're trying to fight against. Okay. So learning, uh, enjoyment or emotion for long-term memory. Uh, that's important. Matches learning targets flow, not too easy, not too difficult. Learning is individual. And then, um, Great book with James Paul G. Jim um, about video games and learning and literacy. So he's a, he's an amazing. It, it, this is a, amazing this is person. just a great checklist. This link and it's in the um, collection also for the week about um, what are the principles of video games that yeah. really apply to education. And then it's, you kind of reverse engineer that and you think, well, given that these are the learning principles, learning principle you're teaching in class, how do I, I know I'm supposed to be teaching what so, X, how do I use this? How do I use a couple of these learning principles as I'm teaching about that? Yeah. And Gene, I, I, I'm really somewhere down the road, um, you know, whether it's next week or we connect, I really want to um, kind of walk you through uh, the teacher feast 
because it, it gives you ways of it gives teachers time to learn but also plan and create uh, and that's all part of the professional development that's that's there and that's that's a way that we've worked around uh, worked around this so there's a local school district uh, in Champaign Illinois which is Champaign Urbana that's the University of Illinois where they um, they're wanting to learn about games and learning so we're creating a teacher feast that they'll get some technology training but they're also going to get some games and learning training and me and some others will help them figure out how to integrate playful learning uh, so that when they go into the next school year they'll have lessons ready to go and and not be where and then start connecting with other educators that are doing it too so they're just not hung out to dry or they go to a workshop this is how you do it and then the the workshop's over and you've done nothing to plan for it and then you've got to do it on your own time that's that's why I love Bring the us along. I just so we first we covered uh, we just covered to learning. So what is oh my goodness gracious? Are you kidding me? Learning. So we've <laughs> we've got we don't have a lot of time here. Um, and it almost makes me wonder because I know we go until eight thirty. If maybe Wait, we, we have nine minutes ahead. What? Pardon? We You're um week. Yeah, you, you you broke up there. Are you, okay. Is he breaking up for all of you too? Okay. Maybe we can cover some okay. of this next week. Yeah, that's what I was kind of getting at. So uh, okay, the yeah. So what? How do you want to handle this? I know we haven't. Is that would that be okay for the rest of you? Because next week was supposed to be a recap, but maybe next week we'll use to cover we the others up. part. Yeah, because there was just so much tonight. Yeah, if you can respond, is that okay to go through the others uh, others part next week? Yeah, lot to digest. So okay. then let's cover a little bit about what what people should do over the course of um, of this week. Okay, do you want so, to do that, Mitch? Sure. Okay. So on the um, on, on the Twitter chat, which is you know hashtag EdChatFlow, uh, we're going to ask four questions, and um, it'd be what we'd like is for you to respond to these questions and also respond to the answers of the other people in the class. Um, what were the takeaways from this second session? How can you use them? Uh, when is it okay to have fun activities without specific learning objectives? Um, what is an a fun activity that you'll try and I'm that will also involve learning? Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'm going to take out we'll the try to readjust. with yeah. others. We'll readjust and, then, the um, and then so far, what differences have you noticed in the way you teach since the course began? So th that's, um, you know, those are the four questions. What would be great is if you could create a lesson plan and put it in the second sheet of that Google spreadsheet. Uh, there's a link to it in the collection for the, for this week. So doc, you know, create a lesson plan of something that you're going to teach. Uh, and don't, lesson don't do, don't do a lesson plan. Like, Oh my goodness gracious. Like the ones that my interns have to do for the universe. No, it's just one, a simple one page. Outline. Right. The, yeah. No, nothing. Half yeah. Page. Um, oh, what's the name of the woman that, um, I can't remember the name. I, uh, the lesson plan. Oh, there's a, her names associated with it. Uh, so yeah, and we might adjust this. What I would really like to see, uh, it, and maybe we can put this in there, Mitch, is mm -hmm. that um, what is something that, you know, how have you taken a learning target or maybe an activity that you've done and made it in a way that either has an emotional or a personal connection or adding some type of fun to it, right? So it, really, we have those ways. We have the emotion. Uh, it could be fun. Um, and then maybe a personal connection, right? You know, so can you take something and change it to where it's going to reach your participants? That's, and like I said, that's been a real change for me uh, in the past few years is is trying to make those connect trying to make things relevant and if i can't then you know is that something i really need to be teaching 
maybe I need to so have I'm another paraphrase that and say yeah. so the the learning the documentation or the lesson plan should be some something that takes a learning objective and hopefully ties it to something that's fun where there's an emotional connection and that has or, personal relevance yeah or yeah or or, yes, or. So, or. Know, it has some type of emotional or personal connection or something that's you know enjoyable or fun okay. all right so, I'll so change, how, how I'll, can you change, change it? it yeah just do that and i'll send does everybody that, out an email tomorrow yeah so does that work i know you had some yeses there but does that does that sound like an idea i think that's something good that if you can share for next week Please respond. Okay. <laughs> and if you have, have questions, there's a delay. I'm like, they're just not responding. If you have questions, come up. Yeah. If if um, just raise your hand, and if you want to ask us about this yeah. week, you want to come up? That would be great. That's great. Then then um, I'll send out an email. <laughs> We've tomorrow. done our job. With or kind of <laughs> revised instructions minutes. for this coming week. Okay. Okay. Good. Hopefully that that gives you something to think uh, about. Okay. And we, Mitch, just speaking out loud. Yeah, here, and please give us some feedback. Can you can you hear me? Other than the fact that Mitch okay. is breaking up, and I don't know uh, if I'm breaking please up give or not. Give us some feedback. Yeah, we might be looking at another platform for next week. So look for an email on that, please. Because yeah, it's just it's continuing to break, Mitch. Okay. Yeah, I'll 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 set up with a different platform for next week. Okay. Cool. Okay. Good to see all of you. And uh, see you all online during the week and back on, um, you know, probably WebEx um, next week. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good night, then. Take care. Good night. Okay. Bye. Mitch, do you want to get on Skype? Sure.